so hello everyone uh, welcome to shaper talks in today's panel we'll be discussing mental health coping techniques in times of adversity and stress uh, i'm karina and i will be moderating this session along with my colleague marta um shaper talks is a project that's brought to you by the global shapers paris hub um, and its aim is to equip young women with the tools um, with tools to help them thrive in, in the workplace and to progress in, in their careers. Now, that, uh, this, these sessions are uh, open to men. So even if we choose our themes based on, um, on issues that impact women and topics that impact women, most of the times these impact everyone, like mental health. Uh, so everybody is more than welcome to, to join. Um, we are very excited to have some great speakers today, but before I introduce them, I'll give uh, my colleague Fanny, who is our hub curator, a chance to very briefly introduce the Global Shapers. Thank you, Karina, and thanks everyone, Mark, uh, Emma, and Michaela for being here. We're very happy to have you. Um, the Global Shapers community, as you might know, was founded by the World Economic Forum. It's a community of young people age under 30. Um, driving um, actions and uh, dialogue uh, to have a positive impact in the world and in their city. So we're based in Paris right now and we're uh, 40 members uh, in Paris, but more than uh, 10,000 in the world. So thank you again for being here and, um, and I hope uh, everyone has a great session. Okay, great. Thank you, Fanny. Um, just to be mindful of time, I will very briefly introduce our speakers, but if you want to learn more about them, go to our social media because we'll link to their pages and you'll find more information there. Um, we'll have, we'll, you know, we'll have a panel, we'll ask questions, give them a chance to, to answer and teach us some great techniques, but we'll make sure to leave 10 minutes at the end for a Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mikhaila Musilova, who is an ast analog astronaut and director of High Seas, which is part of the International Moon-Based Alliance. She has been the commander of numerous simulated missions to the Moon and Mars, and she's calling us from Mars today. Uh, at the High Seas Station in Hawaii and at the, the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. Uh, she has led teams in extreme conditions and she managed to keep them mentally healthy and productive. Emma Barba is a healing meditation therapist and a guide for yoga practice. She has trained as a yoga teacher in the Indian Himalayas and is a five-time certified theta, theta healing practitioner. She teaches this, these practices to help others take advantage of their benefits and is also a social entrepreneur and has founded Bright Living. Mark Anscombe is founder of the Perspective Project, a social enterprise using art and creativity to open conversations about mental health and supporting artists with mental health conditions. Mark is also co-founder of How Mental, an organization committed to ensuring everyone everywhere gets the right support for me their mental health. Now, um, our first question to you, and please, when it's your turn, feel free to add anything that, you know, it's important for people to know and I may have forgotten. Um, what are some techniques that you use in order to calm yourself down in times of stress? And I'll start with, uh, with Michaela. Okay, well, hi everyone, or aloha from Hawaii and, and slash Mars. Um, Okay, so for me, I mean, I am by no means an expert, uh, like, like Emma, for instance. So this is everything I'll be sharing today is just from my experience that I kind of just, you know, learned on the go. Um, I, I've dealt with various stressful situations on the simulated uh, Mars and moon missions, but also I've done expeditions in the Arctic and all over the place, all over the world. So the situations many times, you know, were unexpected. Suddenly some wild animal is charging at you or a crazy storm just arrived and destroyed everything you were working on and you have to improvise with what you have. Or here on this Martian station, you know, our life support system, something happens to them and we quickly have to think out of the box like in Apollo 13 and, you know, figure out a solution to a problem. And many times, yes, it gets very stressful and it's easy to kind of succumb to the stress 
and start panicking and you know then you stop thinking rationally and that's why it's really really important to calm yourself down and you probably heard this elsewhere but breathing actually very much is the key just don't forget to breathe really focus on just breathing in and out calming yourself down by kind of slowing the way you breathe and at the same time i just you know keep on reminding myself of the important things for instance um in an incident here uh, at the high sea station if something broke okay it's it's not ideal but we're not gonna die right now <laughs> so let's just calm down think about what is the most important thing we need to do right now okay fix the leak for example if we're if water's leaking so just you know assemble everyone uh, think about what tools we need, organize who's going to do what, and just really just focus on the priorities. Because a lot of people, when they're stressed out, they start panicking, running around, they, they forget what they actually need to do. So really breathing, calming yourself down and thinking, what do we actually need to do? What can wait and be put aside? And then just organize yourself personally and others that you're working with to deal with a problem. And once you start working on something, you'll be so focused on that that you know it will calm you down too as long as you just kind of keep repeating these things to yourself and and, and breathing and that that's usually basically what what i do okay great how about you mark do you have any any techniques in times of stress yeah i i think i identify a lot of what Michaela was was saying um partly partly in terms of how you frame frame situations that you find stressful um, so a lot of my work, um, quite thankfully, I'm not facing any wild animals or, or weather conditions like, like Michaela was outlining. Um, it's very much, you know, I've worked in a very business context for, for most of my career. Um, we do also do things like on the ground installations and, and a bit more hands on work. But, but largely, I find my, my stress levels are quite you know, low lying, but, but, but consistent um, with business priorities, trying to run a social enterprise or, and a charity in, in fairly tough conditions. And at the end of the day, I think, as Michaela was saying, it's very important just to just to rationalize and say, actually, this is not life like life or death situation. Um, you know, if this project doesn't go as well as we anticipated, is that in our control? What in our in our control can we change, and what can we let go? Um, and and I'm saying all this in the kind of in in the context of especially when it comes to mental health and and I, I think mental health and stress are, you know, one and the same in terms of how they, how they, how they work within yourself. You know, mental health is not just diagnosed conditions. It's how you are on a daily basis and how you respond to, to external pressures and stresses and, and things in your life. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're going to find things stressful full stop, even if it's a tiny thing, even if it's just a, a small thing in your day to day life that on the surface may not seem particularly challenging. Um, and that's when it comes down to your personal personal approach. So for me, I do exercise. Like if I'm feeling stressed, I get out of the house, I go on a run or I, I go on a walk or, or however I'm feeling in, in that moment. Um, and, and I think that's really key is that you, when you know you're encountering stressful situations is not, not to forget those, those self-care tools and those things that you do. Um, it's very easy to think to yourself, oh God, I've got a ton of work to do by tomorrow afternoon. I'm just going to get my head down and work all, work all day and all evening. And for me, that's never, that's never been a productive and fruitful approach. Um, for me, like knowing that stress can be combated by a good routine, by doing things that I like, doing things that for me, like exercise, alleviate stress. It's important to sort of frame, frame what you're doing in, in that context, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Now moving to our expert, Emma. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, but I might get, uh, get a little bit geeky now. Um, Mikhaila, thanks for uh, sharing. Um, Mark, thanks for sharing. Maybe we're not dealing uh, with tigers uh, so much or with wild animals anymore, but we used to in the past and our brain has developed um, and adapted to this very well and maybe we don't have a tiger running around the house but maybe we have a stressful boss we have a global pandemic going on which is like a, a mammoth it's not even a tiger so what we're doing is we're uh, bringing that engaging that part of the brain that's um, dealing with stress and reacting responding uh, we act from a fear place and to me personally um, part of big part of my journey has been to learn to respond rather than react 
and to take things more calmly and rationally. Um, and this goes to a totally different part of the brain, uh, which is uh, the neocortex. Geeky, I told you. And how do we um, develop that neocortex? How do we how, how do we um, create these mental pathways that we don't react but, uh, but respond, that we don't live so much from a place of fear? And it's meditation, it's movement, it's breath work, um, and all these things that you, we have been reading about, but they actually do work. They they change the chemistry in the body and they work for me. I used to have severe anxiety um, in my life and meditation has become the place where I sit with myself, develop intimacy with myself and get a chance to process my own emotions. And the breath is amazing. So when you think about the breath, so when you have a tiger chasing you, how are, are you breathing? You're not breathing in a very long, calm way. No, you're... <laughs> someone's chasing you right so when you breathe very shallow in a very shallow way your mind is going to think oh so now i have a threat going on in my life uh that deadline or this thing that i need to do so obviously we're going to feel stressed but if we learn to breathe deeply or we use the breath in moments when um maybe there's a, a perceived threat it can be or it can not be a threat but it's all about how we perceive it we can actually use the brain to change the chemistry in our body, uh, the breath. And this is something that I do every day. Um, you know, I know many people talking about meditation, breath work. This is something part of my of my routine and also movement, movement. What do you do when you're chased by a tiger? Run. <laughs> but now we sit with our stress. We are used to feeling the stress in the body and not going anywhere, just freezing or just sitting there. So move, go for a run, do yoga. Um, of course, I'm going to say do yoga, but maybe you don't like yoga. Maybe you want you want to do HIIT training or whatever. By the way, I do yoga, HIIT training, running, um, and I used to have asthma. So asthma comes from anxiety. Um, I healing my anxiety. I healed my asthma. It's a long story, but simply Meditate, breathe, and move, um, and hydrate. <laughs> Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Emma. Actually, you bring us right next to the next question, because you were saying there are no tigers, but there's COVID, and it has affected us all you know, mentally, uh, some more heavily, some less. Do you think there are long-term effects and uh, can you think of ways to limit that damage that was caused by confinement and the uncertainty of COVID? Emma? Um, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it's clearly affecting us all uh, one way or another. And before I answer your question, um, I'd like to invite you all to think how exactly it's affecting us. We are living in security. We are living social distancing. So all of these, uh, if we go back to that reptilian brain, um, these are almost like death threats. Because uh, they can be perceived like death threats. Because in the past, if you were secluded from your, uh, in, from your tribe, you could actually die. So being secluded right now can feel very threatening. Fortunately, we're in the situation where, when we can connect. Um, so I think that finding ways to bring meaningful connection uh, between people can be a way to set back the effects of this pandemic. Um, also trying to reduce expectations um, about the future trying to to detach and to let go of control because as we are noticing few things are going as we hope for as we hope them to do so maybe doing a little bit every day what we can to improve our lives instead of trying to make long-term plans or thinking that 
um, this is going to work out or this not. So thinking more day by day, taking things day by day, doing what we can to not just to survive, but to be alive, to be alive in this moment uh, and to enjoy every single day, to enjoy every single day and the parameters that we can right now. Um, because there are blessings in what we are living now. Um, of course, we are waiting to travel again. We are waiting to meet um, in groups again. Who doesn't? And I, during my meditation today, all I could think about it was I have to find a way to travel somehow. But until we do, um, how about we learn to appreciate our immediate environment, which maybe we, we've grown tired with because we're there every day. Um, appreciate the people and find more meaning, find more meaning. Maybe this situation has given us the, the chance to sit back, um, maybe cut off some, some connections that were not working and expand on others and amplify other connections. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Emma. I'd love to hear also your take, Mikhail and Mark, on uh, these long-term effects of COVID and how you think we can, you know, prepare. Uh, I think I, I'll just chip in briefly. I mean, essentially what, what Emma said, but uh, I think, you know, for someone, again, non <laughs> without that training, uh, something I've developed over the years is, um, like Emma was saying, you know, appreciation for what you have. So really gratitude, this kind of the positive energy that comes from being grateful for something that it's incredible and it just keeps me going. So in the in the worst times um, and I need to stop myself from getting emotional because gratitude triggers that instantly in me. Um, I, you know, I'm grateful. I still have a family and friends and I can communicate, even though it's, it's like this virtually. It's not ideal, but. I still have them and I still have people to talk to and listen to me. Um, I can, you know, still go for a run. I can, you know, still go and do things that I like to some degree. Obviously, it's not as much as I would like to. I can't travel. Uh, work is limited in some ways. Um, but instead of yeah, letting that get to you, really think, you know, it's all about the perspective. Think about the bigger picture. Think about there are people elsewhere who are, you know, in more unfortunate situations, sadly. Um, so be grateful for what you have. Remind yourself of that regularly. That's really important. And then like Mark was saying earlier, you know, there are just some things that are out of your control uh, in the job situation or now pandemic wise. Just accept that there's nothing you can do about it. So just don't let it, you know, hurt you uh, and, and stress you out. Instead, just accept it and let go and, and move on and that's usually what I tend to do with most situations I try to rationalize and be like okay what can I do is there something in my power that I can do to make this better you know if I made a mistake I apologize I try and make it better but if there's really nothing else other than that that I can do I just have to accept that it's done and I have to move on and that moving on element is, is something else that that's very important to me. I, I think I think I'd add to that, Michaela. I completely agree. I think there's one angle of this, which is effectively like it's okay to feel shit about this. And actually, like I, I, you know, in in the first, so in, I'm I'm in the UK, and you know, we've had effectively three lockdowns. Um, and in the first, how my mental health has shifted over over the course of these lockdowns, I think has has always surprised me. But I think the thing that's kept me going is in a certain way is almost, I don't want to say the opposite, but a different take on it is um, this is an unprecedentedly crap and terrible time for everyone. And even using the word unprecedented is so, you know, overused and cliche and, 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 and boring. And it's okay to think, oh, this is rubbish. I can't see my mates. I can't go to work. I can't do the things I love. I'm going to have a day where I'm just watching Netflix and feeling sorry for myself. And we've all done that over the last year. Um, I definitely haven't spent every day being thankful, being thankful for, for, for my health and, and, and everything. And I think that's okay. Like it's okay to, to feel shit in this time. Cause it's pretty rubbish. <laughs> that's what I'd add. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's very true. But you know, like it's something new for most of us, but maybe for you, Michaela, in a way 
you were used to going on these missions, you know, being isolated, being away from everyone. This is not new to you in a way. Like, do you think you were better prepared or was it as shocking to you as, you know, as it was for the rest of us, not astronauts? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, of course, th there is a certain advantage to uh, having done all these simulated missions and expeditions that yeah, you get used to being isolated away from the world. For instance, I'm doing a little time warp thing here talking to you right now, but normally our communications with Mars, there's a 20 minute delay each way during a simulated mission. Uh, with Moon, it's only a few seconds because it's much closer to Earth. Uh, but for example, when I was in Greenland on an expedition, we were in the middle of nowhere. There was no signal, nothing. So for months, our only communication with the world was a satellite phone and we could only send a text maybe once or twice a week to our families and loved ones that uh, that were still alive. A polar bear hasn't eaten us yet, you know, so uh, and, you know, and that's when you really appreciate, uh, well, on one hand, what it's how great it is to be disconnected from the world and not have to deal with social media and the news and all those things. But at the same time, yeah, just, you know, what are the benefits of that, of being able to connect with people all over the world very easily like this, just through, through a phone call. And so, uh, yeah, with time, you, you know, kind of develop techniques of, of um, accepting your situation and making the most of it. Uh, but the one thing that definitely was a surprise was obviously we to this day we still don't know how long this pandemic is going to go for you know when are things going to get back to what we used to call normal or, or something closer to that there's a lot of unknowns and and that i would say is the main difference between you know what i've experienced so far and and the pandemic is that at least you know when i would go on a mission whether it was eight months or two weeks or whatever i would know that there's an end date and we could always work towards that you know count down days there's a light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing and here we just we just don't know and that's i think what adds the extra stress to everyone but i mean if there's if things i can share from my experience and, and you probably heard it all over the last year but really um apart the kind of positive things I mentioned uh, before, uh, we kind of organize our days to be busy from morning to evening. And, and not just work, we also, you know, have some more fun activities, exercise, which was mentioned before is very important uh, psychologically, but obviously physically as well. But the fact that you always have something to look forward to, something to do, um, part of it are social activities. So we work together as a crew, whether we exercise together, watch a movie or play some games or just talk. Um, those are important things. And then uh, I would say really focus on working on your own patience with other people, but with yourself as well. Like we talked about, you know, Mark mentioned, you know, just accepting that <laughs> some things suck, unfortunately, but that's okay. Um, when I choose crew members, I look for people that are very empathetic, that clearly, you know, have worked with um, other people before in teams that can be leaders and followers at the same time. And so you can really put yourself into the shoes of someone else. So during a pandemic, you know, some of you may have been um, living with someone else at the time and after a while they're probably driving you crazy with some some habit they have or thing they do or don't do and uh, hopefully you found ways to coexist with them and you know if you're still struggling just remind yourself that everyone is dealing with the situation differently you know some people are handling it pretty well and others are just freaking out and just you know keep that in mind and, and have some patience with them and most importantly communicate that that's the other very important thing i would say is um what saved me over the last year is that whether i'm on mission and i only have five crew members that we live here for a few weeks together or or i'm alone at home and i can only communicate like this with my family and most of my friends which are everywhere else but hawaii so really i just try and be in touch almost every day with different people and just not feel alone or oh, and if there's something bothering me i want to talk to someone about it don't keep it in and that's also the way we work on missions i'd rather people you know come to me and we discuss their problems even if it's you know me that's the problem rather than them kind of bottling it in and then it explodes at some point so those are things that i learned from missions that i, I hope have can help others too they definitely help me but of course this is a, a new thing for all of us and we're all kind of learning as we go. 
Thank you, Mikael. I would love to stay with you guys, but I unfortunately have to leave, so I'll leave the floor to Corina and uh, have a great session. It was very interesting so far. Bisous. Thank you, Marta. Corina? Yeah, Corina, you're unmuted. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. It happens to the best. That's a very good point. It helps. Um, I was saying, okay, let's let's switch gears because you know, supporting mental health through art is quite original, quite an original angle. So, Mark, I'm I'm curious to know what your experience is with with art as a tool to alleviate stress and anxiety? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll give a very like brief background of what Perspective Project does just to sort of frame frame the, the conversation. Um, so we are a social enterprise who support artists who have mental health conditions, um, either diagnosed or, or in often cases self-diagnosed or who produce art that responds to mental health. So it could be themselves or their friends or family. Um, we originally started as just a Facebook page sharing pictures, um, did it in my spare time. Um, but there's something about the use of art to, to, to communicate quite personal topics and quite personal issues or moments or feelings um, that seemed to resonate quite well. Um, so we got a lot of good press coverage in the early days, a lot of submissions from around the world um, from a huge range of, of artists doing a, a range of wonderful stuff. So. Um, visual art so people painting and you know it could be from depression anxiety which is obviously the majority of our submissions are about those two disorders as they're the most prevalent or some of the most prevalent um all the way to you know various types of, of diagnosis and experience so it could be related to eating disorders or bipolar or or whatever it is um and we put on exhibitions we do gallery gallery events or pop-ups and open mics and all kinds of any way of expressing expressing mental health through art, um, and I, I think uh, one when I talk when I think about why why people seem to engage and why artists use art for to reflect their mental health, I think you can really look at it from a, a couple of key angles. I think the, the summary is that for a lot of the artists, it's a cathartic mechanism um, by which they value having a medium to to get these complex or deep or, or, or feelings that they may not understand themselves or may not fully engage with themselves onto an external, you know, into an external space. Um, and that's really where the idea came, came, came for the Perspective Project was I used to work on a, on a volunteer call line um, called Nightline. It's like Samaritans in the UK where you can phone up and, and talk about anything you want with the person on the line. And what those, what those lines are, are effectively validating supporting cathartic spaces to express yourselves so you can phone up and and whatever you say to the person at the other, to the other end within reason they're going to they're going to validate you they're going to support you they're going to give you positive positive vibes back may not be positive answers but but they give you that cathartic space and i thought that translates really well to how people receive and engage with art and creativity um, and, and there's a couple of key themes emerge in terms of the use of art. And I think one of them is, is art as introspection, um, i.e. looking inside yourself and trying to understand and sit with your emotions. And really, um, you know, the art itself can often physically and, and, and visually resemble. So it could be a, a head exploding or, or a person who is feeling, you know, literally is covered in a shroud or is, or their body is, 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 curled up and often it's very body bodily metaphors or bodily bodily visual images um, so you have art but as introspection and the other end of the spectrum almost is is art as escapism um, so we get a lot of art which is you know fantastic in origin so it could be of creatures or or abstract visuals or 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 you know any anything that doesn't directly respond to and reflect a, a state and Often, so so what we do as a project is we ask people to submit written statements with their art. And often you find that what they're saying is, you know, art is their escape mechanism. It's their way of getting out of their head. It's their way of, you know, their day-to-day -day experience with their mental health is so overwhelming and so all-encompassing that they use art to get away from that and to, to exist in a different different realm. Um, and I, I think often it's, it's the conversation of two opposites coming together. And I think escapism and introspection 
are actually probably you know two sides of the same the same horseshoe and they they, they come together in this this idea that a lot of people pour their emotions into a piece of art as an external place to hold that emotion whether it's escaping their life whether it's you know looking into their life and introspecting um that's really how i see our body of work is is divided often is to you know introspection and escapism really um I'm not sure that answered the question but yeah oh it did it did and out of curiosity did mm. you receive more pieces of art since the beginning of the of the pandemic have you seen any fluctuations I haven't I actually we haven't seen much of a of a change really I think I think one of the one of the key elements of I mean it's a really over 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 said thing to say that mental health is a massive massively widespread issue and many people experience it and everyone knows the high level stats of you know one in four people will have mental will experience mental health issues you know it's it's not like the pandemic is is a is a causing some new and unfounded um unfounded kind of previously previous issue that you know we haven't seen a massive rise there has been i know there's been an uptick in creative activity so i have loads of friends who have taken up painting and drawing and we, we talk about it as a process but surprisingly no um i'm not sure why that is um but i was expecting a massive uptick but we haven't really seen it okay well you know that's probably good news <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, my the other work I'm doing. So I, I also work with How Mental, which is an organisation supporting people with mental health conditions and supporting other organisations. And the story is completely opposite with that. In that oh, really? all of our all of our partners and clients who provide teletherapy or counselling or other support services and and tools are just absolutely overwhelmed. Um, the they are you know we have people who are, you can't hire therapists quick enough to meet demand. Um, yeah, it's a, it's quite a scary prospect, I think, for the next few years in terms of the pent up um, mental health crisis coming or continuation of the crisis. Yeah, no, I, I think I mean there's there's almost definitely going to to be some some repercussions in in that space, and I think that's something else that touches on on issues of the pandemic is keeping a healthy work life balance, right? Because uh, a lot of mental health issues come from this unbalance between our personal life and our professional life. Um, and most of us weren't able to help keep a healthy work-life balance before the pandemic. Now it's even worse. Um, Emma, you were you were in the corporate world before, right? Did you did you manage to have a healthy work-life balance at that point? Or do you think you would be with what you know today? And just in general, what do you suggest to to us? in in this uh, I'll, I'll stick to the term corporate world i used to work um in education uh, and ngos and i i want to stress this because um i felt like having a mission um gave me somehow um an excuse to not take care of myself <laughs> And sometimes that's what, what tends to happen um, in the NGO world where we, we want to change the world, we want to bring some, some value, more value, we have a mission, we feel that if we stop working 12 hours a day, we fail our mission. Um, and my message here is that if we want to change the world, we need to change ourselves and not so much change ourselves but um take care of ourselves it's like in the plane when you're instructed to put your own oxygen mask first and we we think that we have to do these big changes in the world we have to make big impact but you have a small part of the universe right there holding your own face or yourself and that's what that's what we need to take care of and it's enough if, if we do this this is enough if you only imagine one each and every person taking care of themselves in a way that is not abusing others respects others right this is not selfish um attitude it is strategic it's smart i take care of me you take care of you and then we share our happiness right 
So to put this into the workplace, I would say prioritize uh, yourself, prioritize your own well-being above anything else, above above the well-being of the organization, above anything else. If we are not okay, if you show up at work and you're tired, stressed, you're not going to deliver, you're not going to bring results, you're going to create conflict. It's like people walk around today like bombs <laughs> waiting to explode because that stress that we've accumulated in work does not go out anywhere else. So to uh, cut this long speech and to give you uh, like simply techniques, set in calendar in your calendar, because if you're working in the corporate world, you like to have calendars, you like to be organized. So set in your calendar a time that is non-negotiable when you're going to take care of you and be very specific about the activity that you're going to do. Um, get an accountability partner so that you can't escape. Let's say you want to go running, right? Set that in calendar, talk to someone and you go uh, running together, then you can bail, simply bail out of, it, out of it. Or what I used to do, I used to work 12, 14 hours before. And when I realized that I have to set boundaries, I started to simply um, take part in courses or stuff that was going on in the evening. And at 6.30 at night, I was leaving the office and people were like, what? I thought you were going to be here the whole night. Well, no, this is my new lifestyle. Now I have to somewhere to be. And, but that was my commitment. That was my practice. But even before you get to that stage, maybe a good question would be to ask yourself, um, how are you trying to validate? So if you're in a situation where you work so much and you simply cannot say no, how are you trying to validate yourself through the work that you do? What are you trying to get that you didn't get maybe in the past that you now feel so desperately that you want to get because in the in the um in the workplace we recreate our families and i have done that over and over and over again um and when you when you realize this you realize that it's okay to disappoint your boss by saying no because your boss is not your mom or your dad um and it's okay to disappoint them and you're not a child. Maybe you have a small child inside, but you can reassure that child. You're the one who needs to parent that child, not your boss, not someone saying, oh, how good you are, right? So don't be afraid to disappoint people. It's okay. It's okay to disappoint people. If you disappoint the right people, you are where you need to be. I, have, I, I was always a good child um 10 always like the highest grades uh, always wanting to be good enough was never good enough according to my parents until one day i said i don't want to be good for someone i just want to be happy and i just want to live my life and when i went to india my parents um were they almost kicked me out of the family. <laughs> they were like, how are you? How are you leaving your beautiful career in communication of nine years? We paid for, didn't pay, but we supported you through, through college, through blah, blah, blah. And, but I was like, no, I know this is my mission. I know that I have to do this. And I already had enough awareness to know that if I disappoint them, it's a good thing because now they're disappointed. But when I'm happy and thriving, they're going to be happy and thriving. And three years later, yes, they are. And now they're my biggest um, supporters. And my mom is sharing all my posts on Facebook constantly. And my dad is endorsing me to I don't know what people. So by being authentic and saying no to the right things, the people you are saying no to are going to thank you because you are authentic. So your gut is telling you when you, you, when you get one more 
task, one more deadline, or too tight of a deadline, your gut is already telling you, mm, this doesn't feel good, this is not good, but are you going to go in, into pleaser mode and say, yeah, I'm going to try, I can do everything, or are you going to be mature and you're going to say, mm, okay, here's what's on my list, do you, this is too much, uh, I cannot do this. When I started saying no, I was saying no like 10 times a day. No, this is not part of my job. This belongs to a different person. I can do this next month. Uh, I have this other priority. In the beginning, it felt horrible. It felt I wasn't used to that because I wanted to be the best. I wanted to say yes to everything. I could do everything, but it was not smart. So to sum it up, <laughs> this would be um, find find ways to work with your own discomfort um, of why you're making your work, which is only part of your life, your top priority. When your work should be supporting your dreams. So I'm getting to another idea, but also how are you framing your world, your work and your life? Are you making your work your life or are you working to have a life? What else do you have in your life other than, than your work, your friends, your family, your health, your passions, your book, the world outside? What's your life about? And then you're, you're going to see work is, is beautiful. It, it's beautiful and it's a context where you know yourself and you earn money and everything, but it's not everything. So it needs to be part of, of your life. And then you start to take care of the other things. So frame what work means to you. Um, frame what it means for you to say no and why you feel maybe you don't want to say no. What's in there? Why do you feel? Because in normal situations, you can have a mature conversation. This is what you're giving me to do. I'm going to say no to this, why? Let's negotiate, you're going to have a negotiation. And then set a time frame uh, when you're going to do your thing, your own thing, uh, and you don't need anyone's approval for that. And don't feel guilty for not replying to messages at 10 o'clock in the evening as I used to. I was expected to reply what's up at night. And you know what I started to do? I was simply not checking my phone. Uh, and then in the morning at nine, I would be like, oh, now I see your message. Of course, I had seen there was a message, but I chose to ignore it. And uh, my boss went on me and she said, what, you're not this loyal. Uh, you don't want to be uh, part of this team anymore. I'm like, I'm sorry. I only work within these hours and these hours. Well, now you're being rude. I'm sorry if you see it like that. So you just have to stand up. You just have to stand up for yourself. Thank you. That's that's very inspirational. I think it is a proof proof of maturity to be able to just you know pencil in some in your agenda some time for for yourself and say no. It's not easy, but it's very useful. Um, before we we go to Q and A, I'm actually very interested, Michaela. How do I mean your your professional life during missions is the same as your private life, isn't it? <laughs> How, are, are are you able to <laughs> to have any work life balance in in these periods, or how do you how do you manage it? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of laughing in my head a little bit at the work life balance question because I'm I'm a terrible <laughs> example of that, <laughs> where I, I have been working on saying no for some time and and I've definitely gotten better at it, um, but I think for me it's not so much um, let's say like a, a parent issue like Emma was saying, but it's more you know I I'm grateful for everyone that has helped me along my path and I would hate to say no and disappoint other people that need help because I feel like, well, people help me, so I should help people. Um, so that's it. And then, then, of course, there's also the, uh, you know, having certain ambitions in life or people have certain expectations of me. I don't want to let them down. But I admit uh, one of my tricks to somewhat success is that I, I will do a kind of 80-20 <clears throat> balance of I'm not a perfectionist. I will never 
or most of the time I'm not going to attempt to do something 100% because many times those details get lost anyway. The PowerPoint presentation doesn't have to be super beautiful and transitions all perfect and water because no one cares about that really. They care about the content of your presentation or you know whatever it is most of the time in life <clears throat> things don't need to be perfect. Okay if you are an engineer and you're designing an airplane and you know it needs to be perfect so people don't die okay don't listen to me in that case, but the smaller things in life, when you can let that 20% go, it has been something that has really helped me because then people don't expect perfection from me all the time. Sometimes, yes, and I really try my best. And other times I'm like, I can, I can let go of some things and it makes me feel so much better. And it's kind of part of saying no, but in, in a different way. But yeah, during missions, it's difficult because um, for, for the most part, I'm commander, so I'm in charge of five other people and I need to make sure that they're safe, they're happy, they're healthy, they're doing all, all their projects well. And so I actually, I, I can't even think about myself that much. It's all about everyone else. But then at the same time, if I get sick or something bad happens to me, that's going to affect the whole mission. And that's when I have to keep on reminding myself what Emma said is that, you know, like in the airplane, first put the oxygen mask on you and then on other people. If I'm not going to be OK, the whole mission could fail. So while I feel responsibility for others, you know, I need to start with myself. And those are the things that kind of help me find a, a certain balance while on mission. Um, but it is difficult in terms of like the real world outside on on Earth, because I spend so much time here on mission in a, you know, in a fake world, if you will. Uh, it's difficult to then kind of go back to reality and then realize that since I spent so much time on the moon and Mars, I should enjoy Earth more and, you know, my life there. And so it, it's something I'm, I'm still working on. And, and the things that help me is to have things to look forward to. So, you know, when I get back to Earth, I'm going to eat a salad and I'm going to go swim at the beach and see my friends again, even though it might be just be like this virtually. And for me, it's always having those those, you know, positive points to look forward to things like that, that keep me going and, and on a regular basis, ideally. So regular exercise, regular hobbies. Uh, for example, I love dancing. So here in Hawaii, I do hula dancing. And so that's always the thing I look forward to. Yeah, you know, next Tuesday I'll go to hula class or whatever. And um, it's definitely a work in progress for me, but it's just reminding yourself of those things all the time and reassuring yourself that it's okay to think about you and take care of yourself. It's actually extremely important that you do that. Thank you, yes, it is okay to think about ourselves. That is a very good point. And on that note, I will open to questions from the audience. 